Okay. I'd like to invite uh, <laughs> Jerry DeWitt um, to the podium. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard of the Clergy Project. It is a project that was put together by, um, by uh, Dan Barker, who was a former minister. Yeah, I, I think we all know who, that, who he is. And same thing with uh, Richard Dawkins. Um, and they put together a, um, a group to help, I, I want to say, recovering um, ministers or former ministers that have lost their faith, uh, lost their religion, um, deal with the complexities of life and losing their religion. We ha are honored today to have uh, one of their first graduates, uh, Jerry DeWitt, who's going to be talking to us, Thanksgiving versus to Boeing. <laughs> I'm not expecting a call. This is how I'm timing myself with my phone. I am um, recently out of the ministry. As a matter of fact, I only went public um, in October was when I really went public. I preached my... Thank you. Thank you. Wasn't hard. Any fool can do it. All you have to do is be willing to totally screw up everything instantly. And uh, throw away everything you've ever worked for in a moment's notice, and you can do it too. You can have this at no expense whatsoever. Um, so I preached my last message in April. I had struggled with belief for years, and I won't go into that story at the moment. Thank you for being so kind. You are very reflective of what I've experienced thus far. Lost my job December the 1st because of being publicly connected to the clergy project and to recovering from religion, which I'm now the non-paid, and you can make your checks out to P.O. Box 12, no. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm also over recovering from religion, um, started by Dr. Daryl Ray, who wrote The God Virus, if any of you, you're all familiar with that. Everybody always is. So, um, so let me tell you real quick about the Clergy Project. The pictures are the way they are for a particular reason. Uh, Dr. Dan Dennett started a study with researcher Linda Lascola uh, a few years back. He was writing some books and discovered as he was interviewing different ministers, they would just begin to confess to him that they didn't believe and that they literally had stayed in the ministry for a lot of reasons. And the quickest way for me to explain it is how long do you stay in a bad marriage? How long do you stay in a bad relationship? It might be till the kids are grown or till you can afford your own house, which is kind of what ministers get trapped in. And they really are trapped, and I'm trying to put a human face to this very unique need that we face in the atheistic and humanist community. So Dr. Dan Dennett um, kicked this idea around for a while, and these three men, you see Dan Barker and of course Professor Dawkins, as they begin to communicate about this over a couple of years, finally uh, Professor Dawkins said, let's just put our money where our mouth is. He sponsored the clergy project, which I think is pretty cool. And Dan Barker has become the face for it, and he actually runs it, staffs it, keeps it going. Now, basically what this is, is this is a, a safe place for ministers on the Internet anonymously to communicate with each other. Because the questions that they're having to deal with are as large as we're dealing with this morning, such as what do you do with traditions, but they're also extremely large and complicated, like how will I make a living now when all I possess is a degree in theology? Or I haven't yet told my wife, what's a good way to break the news to my wife that we've spent 30 years trying to build a ministry only for me to no longer believe in the ministry at all? So that brings me to recovering from religion. I think that's really what we're all doing. And I think that's even if you've never been religious, even if you've never participated in church services, even if you weren't raised in a religious home, I think because of the shape that our nation has ended up in, I think we're all trying to recover from religion. Collectively, as a nation, we're trying to recover from religion. So this is an organization that I sponsor. And this organization just puts together little groups, 10 people at a time, to talk about their problems, talk about the similarities that they all suffer with. So obviously, traditions is one of them that we're trying to work out in these little groups. Is it okay to have a Christmas tree? Is it okay to celebrate Christmas? Now, I've been dealing with this only for a few months, so I have to really, I have to really take your advice in these things and lean on your wisdom and your experience. There's great leaders, and you know who they are in this assembly this morning. And so I have to take your advice. So really, I just want to come from my 
perspective for just a couple of minutes, if you'll allow me. We all see this now. This is making a lot of news on Facebook, making a lot of news on the news channels. And there's no doubt whenever Tim Tebow started doing this, there's no doubt that there was some sincerity there, that he really meant what he was doing. And he may still mean it as he does it today. But now it's taken on a different meaning. Now it's become customary. And now if he doesn't do it, it's going to mean something, right? Now just as many people are watching to see, is he not going to kneel down and thank God when something happens? And, and, and <laughs> Exactly. You think that's difficult, have a prayer line of about 100 people and 99 of them leave out with the same ailments that they had and the one who claims to be healed claimed to be healed last week and was in the line again tonight. Then you'll know what it's like to try to thank God in hard situations. I've been there. So the situation that he faces is does he continue to make this gesture when maybe the heart isn't in it the way that it used to be? Does he continue to maintain this identity? Because obviously everyone would admit that's not the real Tim Tebow. That's just an image we have up on a screen, and that's a thought that we all think about him, but that's not the real him. He's, he's got complexities, and there's some, obviously some depth to his personality that we're not able to see in this two-dimensional representation. I would say to you that the situation that we're finding ourselves in is attempting to move beyond a collective identity and at the same time express our individuality. That's what free thinking is really about. And that's where all the trouble starts. I would say to you this morning that the whole world belongs to each and every one of us. And my small point of view, very young point of view in this would be if you want to put up a Christmas tree, put up a Christmas tree if you like Christmas trees. Because that's your expression. That's who you are. And to not do it for any other reason other than you don't want to do it would be doing it for the wrong reason. Just like if he ever kneels down just because everybody expects him to kneel down. As a human being on this planet with a very limited space of time on this planet, he's got a right to kneel down or not kneel down based solely on whether or not he wants to. And I think that's what free thought is all about is doing it or not doing it because that's what you want to do. I, I'm coming from the point of view that that what we're involved in and what we're doing is far more than just a war on religion. This to me is the continuation of the evolution of human intelligence, of progressive civilization, and of the expression of humanistic values. So it's not simple. It's not something that we can just write a code of ethics. That's the kind of things that we're trying to move away from. What we have to do is appreciate the uniqueness and the value of every single individual individually, not always collectively. What we do now, the very actions that we take and the people we are today will undoubtedly, whether we intend for it to happen or not, will become the traditions of the generation to come. They will look back on what we're doing and how we do it and how we handle ourselves and decide what they're going to do and what they feel obligated to do. I think we're all recovering from religion. And I think in recovering, we must begin to put all of the complex pieces of our lives into their proper priorities. We have to take each piece seriously. We've been given an opportunity. Do you understand this morning, and I know you do, I'm, I'm kind of preaching to myself for a minute this morning, if that's all right. Because I'm empty. I'm telling you, I am so drained from losing virtually every family member that I've had for the last 42 years. I know you didn't think I was that old, but it's the height that throws you off. All the way to losing my job, I'm washed out. I'm completely washed away. This life that I've tried to build over the last 42 years has now been taken away from me for one reason and one reason only, because I dared to express my individuality. And that's what this is about. Whether a person is atheist who would object to your tree or whether a person is a free thinker or even a Christian who thinks it's hypocritical for you to have a tree, to hell with them.
because this is about individuality. I would say that one of the traditions that we should start extremely early would be that we should celebrate December the 15th, the day that Christopher Hitchens passed away. And we should call it Courage Day. We should call it something representing Christopher Hitchens. And from here on, we should hold that day in remembrance because the things that we're doing now are creating the landmarks and the memories for the generations to come. We're changing history. The greatest gift that you can give as a gift of appreciation to the life that you've been given is to be so thankful, so thankful for this precious moment that you've been given. Now that we no longer believe the fairy tales, we no longer believe that God had some great design and that all of this is about living for the future, we now know that it's about living for the moment. What we need to do as a community is express our thankfulness for this opportunity of being alive, somehow using traditions, if need be, as self-imposed timeouts because all of our lives are running on fast forward. If we can use our traditions like 1030, starting fellowship on a Sunday morning, if we can use that tradition not just to be part of the group, but also to stop and be thankful that our minds have been opened enough to be part of this group and that we're very aware of how special this moment is, if we can have those kind of traditions, then we will pass beautiful traditions on to the next generation. And can the congregation say amen? Thank you for your time.